Hello, and welcome to our talk. My name is Christian Stransky, and today I will present you the results of our paper, 27 years and 81 million opportunities later, investigating the use of email encryption for an entire university. We analyzed 81 million emails over a time span of 27 years to identify the usage of email encryption at a large German university. We've looked at SMIME and PGP specifically. But everyone on our team already expected low numbers. Because everyone already knows that no one encrypts, right? So, why is this important then? Email encryption has a long history of research, with many prominent papers, such as the paper Why Johnny Can't Encrypt from 1999, and many more Johnny papers in the following decades. However, there's one issue with these research papers. There were mostly only short lab studies with few participants to evaluate the usability of different email encryption tools, which were used as a base for the common knowledge that email encryption is too hard for laymen. Of course, there were a few papers that looked at real-world data. However, none of these looked at email encryption in general. The 1996 paper from Whitaker et al. looked at how email users handle an increasing volume of incoming emails. For that, they looked at 2,482 emails from 18 users. This was reproduced in 2006 by Fisher et al. with 600 mailboxes and 28,660 emails. The closest to our topic was in 2005 by Roth et al., where they analyzed which security mechanism would have been the best choice for the users. For that, they looked at 139,000 emails from 17 users. In 2009, Ulrich et al. analyzed public PGP key databases and looked at 2.7 million PGP keys to analyze key properties and graph topologies. In 2018, there was another paper by Avigdor L. Grabli et al., where they analyzed 5 million emails to label email threads with machine learning techniques. From that, we can already see that there has been no research on the actual real-world usage of email encryption so far. So, our research questions were, can we confirm the security community's anecdotal knowledge about low adoption and provide ground truth? And can we validate results from previous work? And can we identify underexplored challenges? Of course, ethics and data protection are important for such a project. So we spent over a year on preparation to adhere to the strict German privacy protection laws of the European General Data Protection Regulation, in or in short, the GDPR. We also involved the Data Protection Officer and the Works Committee early on. This took multiple iterations to discuss open questions and fix, uh, fix issues. We made sure that researchers never got access to raw data. When needed, data was pseudonymized with secure hash functions with random sorts that were unavailable to the researchers. The old data collection uh, pipeline was executed by the university IT staff who operates the email infrastructure. And we of course reduced the amount of data to the absolute minimum we required to investigate our research questions. So, how did the data collection pipeline work? It was structured as follows. In the first step, we created a dedicated email box with as many predefined test cases as we could come up with and exported it as a JSON file to develop our data collection and pseudonymization scripts. After we finished the local development, the script was run by the university IT staff against our own email boxes to identify further issues. We repeated this step until we encountered no further errors on our own email boxes. In the third step, the scripts were again evaluated by the university IT staff and then executed on the secondary email server. During the pseudonymization process, we also used additional asserts to make sure that no personal data would be in the results to account for weird email clients that might write something into unexpected header fields that should not contain any personal data. If one of the asserts failed, the whole email data would be removed and marked as an error. As a last step, the resulting CSV was analyzed by the researchers to answer the research questions. So, let's continue with the results. In general, our dataset covers a time span of 27 years, 37,089 users, and about 81 million emails. 5.46% of all users ever used SMIME or PGP at least once to send an email. However, that also means 94.5% 94, 94 did not. SMIME certificates are free at our university, and most email users in the dataset are highly educated. So we can assume that this dataset overreports on email encryption in comparison to other populations where users would need to pay for an SMIME certificate. We could observe an expected uh, exponential growth of email between 1994 and 2020, as you can see in the graph on the right side. The scales are logarithmic, so the percentages are very hard to see here. 
In total, we found that overall only 0.06% of the emails were encrypted and 2.8% were signed. In general, S-MIME was more widely used than PGP. Let's take a look at the different user groups. These user groups were assigned to one of five uh, user groups based on the subdomains. These user groups include scientific, staff, students, external, and lastly, NX, in, uh, NX internal, which is used for subdomains that don't exist anymore. The SMIME and PGP usage differs between these groups. Starting with SMIME, we can see that users from the staff group have the highest usage of SMIME signatures, with 3.26% of all sent emails being signed, and the scientific group, on the other hand, only signs 2.02% of their emails. Furthermore, students are only signing 0.43% of their emails. If you look at PGP, we can see that the order changes, while the amount of signed mails in general is much lower. Users in the scientific group lead with 0.56% of signed PGP mails, which is only a quarter of the signed SMIME emails that they are sending. Second place are students with 0.32% of signed PGP mails, and lastly followed by staff users with 0.06% of signed mails. These results are not surprising, since most staff users are most likely using pre-configured devices and work at the university for a longer period, while the students are using their own devices. Let's take a look at the most commonly used clients for email encryption. The leader by a large margin is Thunderbird, in combination with Enigmail, which accounted for 65% of the sent SMIME and PGP emails. This is followed by Outlook, which was used for 18.2% of the sent SMIME and PGP emails. Third place is taken by Apple Mail. However, we cannot determine the percentage of sent emails as the copy placed in the outbox by Apple Mail does not contain the Xmailer header, which is included in the actual sent email. One thing that we could observe was that the usage of multiple clients led to a huge difference in signed SMIME emails. As you can see, if only a single client is used, the percentage of signed emails after the first signed email is on median over 60%. However, if two or more different clients are used by a user, the percentage of signed emails drops heavily. This indicates that users might have problems configuring their certificates on a different client. Interestingly, the percentage is growing with more clients used which indicates that power users might be able to configure their clients. For PGP, the picture looks a little bit different. In general, the amount of signed emails is much lower. It seems most users test it and drop it later on again. However, we can again see that the usage of more than one client leads to a lower usage of PGP. Let's take a look at the PGP keys themselves. As we can see, in the early years, DSR keys are the most dominant choice. Around 2008, the usage of ASR started to overtake DSA until 2013, uh, where most keys are using 2048 bits, which then changes to 4096 bits. With the introduction of AutoCrypt in 2017, the key sizes of new ASR keys are lower to 2048 or 3072 bits to accommodate header size limits in emails. In 2019, elliptic curve crypto keys are starting to gain traction. In summary, we can conclude that PGP key types and sizes are technology-driven, and only a small number of insecure keys exist. However, more than a third of the keys do not have an expiration date set. In contrast to PGP, we could observe that some algorithms and configurations clearly dominate. Default settings are widely used and hardly customized. More than 90% of the keys were of the ASR 2048 type. This means that elliptic curves and larger ASR keys are not relevant. Fortunately, we were able to identify very few small ASR keys, and the last key with ASR 512 was generated more than 10 years ago. These should no longer be valid today. On the other hand, keys with ASR 1024 were still generated in 2020. For digital signatures, we could see a, a similar picture. 77% of the certificates supported SHA-256. Fortunately, the last MD5 certificate was generated in 2017. In summary, the chosen algorithms are very homogeneous with the configurations in SMIME. The trust system in SMIME certificates is based on third parties, the certificate authorities. Here we could identify a clear dominance of the Deutsche Telekom as root certificate authority of 65% of all certificates. This also includes certificates from sub-TAs. 
The Deutsche Telekom is a big telecom company in Germany and signs the root certificate of the DFN, which is used by most German universities to sign their certificates. In contrast, only 12% were self-signed and thus not confirmed by a third party. The use of SMIM thus tends to take place in the context of organizations. Unlike PGP keys, SMIM certificates have a final expiration date. After that, the certificate is invalid and it cannot be extended. Users must then create a new certificate and have it reconfirmed by a certificate authority. But this is done, and if so, when? 630 email addresses from the university use their SMIM certificate. One third of them actually had two or more certificates. So of the few people, some actually created a certificate more often. But when? We are able to identify 364 rollovers and 229 of them occurred in time before the expiration. For 42 certificates, there was a period of time without a valid certificate. The university informs about the expiration of a certificate by email. This occurs a few weeks before expiration and is marked with the red line in the graphic. Many users heeded this notice and generated a new certificate. In addition, there is a large number of rollovers, which occurred far in advance, one year and more. The reasons for this can be manifold and are not clear to us, but in many cases certificates are probably simply lost. Let us now look at some findings from related work. Bay et al. reported that participants had concerns and misconceptions about how keys are managed across multiple devices. Similar comments can be found in early publications on end-to-end -end encryption. We observed the impact of these concerns in practice. In our dataset, we could see that even the use of multiple email clients significantly reduces the use of end-to-end -end encryption. One reason for this is certainly that the transfer of keys between applications and especially between devices is complicated. Furthermore, we could observe only three instances of private PGP keys being sent via email. These emails were sent by the users to their own mailboxes, probably in an attempt to distribute the key to a different device. This is not necessarily a problem, as long as the chosen pathways for the private key is adequate. This means private key leakage through email attachment was not an issue for our users. Edward et al. argues that semi-automated key distribution allows users to send secure email. Others argue, others argue similarly, and we also agree with the statement. SMIM supports this by sending the certificate with every signed email. At the same time, however, we observed that significantly more emails were signed than encrypted. In addition, we could see that encryption was not always used. Even after a successful key exchange, only 3.4% of emails are encrypted. So people did not always encrypt, or it would have been possible. We cannot say why, but one possible solution would be automated encryption, if it is possible. In summary, previous research has so far only focused on short-term studies. And we have conducted the first large-scale analysis of email encryption with a focus on SMIM and BGP over a time span of two decades. We could observe the impact of the usage of different and multiple email clients. And we could observe the key exchanges via email and their impact on further encryption. Our key findings are end-to-end -end encrypted emails are very rare and we were able to check the effect of certain events. For example, the Snowden leaks, which doubled the percentage of encrypted emails from 0.035% to 0.07% and the COVID-19 pandemic, which led to an increase of general email traffic as well as a slight increase of signed emails, but at the same time a decrease of end-to-end -end encrypted emails. Furthermore, in 2020, one-third fewer certificates were issued to users, and we could confirm common beliefs and results from previous lab studies. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Right. Do we have questions? Okay. So my question about, uh, by the way, my, my name is Aisa Khalil from Qatar Computing Research Institute. My question is um, about why do we have this rare end-to-end -end encryption? Is it because the organizations themselves, they do not encourage this? Because, you know, I mean, maybe some tools like spam detection and spam filtering, they may not be 
uh, as effective when it comes to encrypted emails? I mean, how can, do, do we think, or do you think that this is, could be one of the reasons why we don't have that adoption or popular adoption of end-to-end -end encryption in addition to usability and other things? Uh, sure, yes, I think that's one of the problems that um, most companies don't encourage it. Um, at our university, there was no rule before we did the study that um, the users should use SMIM. It was always an optional thing. Um, during the COVID pandemic, which was after our data collection, um, the university also introduced a um, uh, rule that SMIM certificates should be used by everyone. So this might uh, have lead to an increase afterwards, but we can't say um, that for sure because we did not uh, we did the collection before that. Uh, Yuvraj from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, thank you for the talk. So uh, I noticed you mentioned that like there's multiple emails have different administrative domains and everybody has to sort of do that if you want to enter an encryption. So I was wondering now that many people are on Gmail or Google Apps and if and they're moving to web like using webmail, if somebody like Google did this so that it was sort of not only between at gmail.com, but also if you're Google Apps, would that help with adoption? Just because then you don't have to configure anything, because presumably it's all on the web, right? So do you, do you see that might help? Um, sure, I, I think if, the, if it would work in within the WebMail clients, it would certainly help with adoption. Um, one thing that would be needed would be something like Let's Encrypt for um, s certificates mm -hmm. for email, so that um, those certificates would not be shown as invalid uh, by most email clients. But if something like that would be introduced, I'm pretty sure it would help, um, at least with assigning if it's automatically. And uh, also, if uh, encryption would be enabled by default, then, then it would certainly help uh, adoption. OK, thank you. Hi, Jeremy Epstein, National Science Foundation. Um, I'm curious if the increase in use of uh, SMTP uh, over HTTPS or, or over other, uh, I'm sorry, not over HTTPS, over TLS, um, and, and other encrypted email uh, at, at the point-to-point -point level is reducing the perceived threat and therefore even though more people are aware of the risk of unencrypted email, because more and more email is going encrypted, not end to end, whether that changes perceptions and maybe it's a rational decision not to bother with SMIME or PGP. Um, I think in general there's a large misconception among users that um, email is um, secure. So um, from in another paper that we did, um, we heard from many users that they thought that email, email would be secure because it's encrypted by default. So uh, they, did, do not uh, they did not understand that it's not end-to-end -end encrypted, but think that it's always um, secure no matter um, how, it's just, uh, how it's sent. But it depends to some extent on what your threat model is. If your threat model yeah, sure. is, is somebody in the uh, coffee shop listening to your email, then it doesn't matter if it's end-to-end -end, as long as it gets to the Gmail server or whatever encrypted, that's probably good enough. But if your threat model is, is a person in the middle, then it's a different animal. Yes, sure, that is a difference. All right, any more questions? Um, maybe I can ask one. Um, what would you suggest for the next Johnny paper now? Um, for the next Johnny paper, that's a good question. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm not exactly sure. So, something like, um, yeah, I'm not, I have no idea. Sorry. <laughs> we don't need another Johnny paper. Um, <laughs> let's thank Christian again.